Yes, hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Aaron Novello podcast. We have a wonderful, dynamic, super powerful and strong salesperson, the pride and joy of Hoboken, New Jersey, Mr. Michael Klein with us. I've had the uh, very good fortune of working with Michael in a coaching capacity for about a year now, maybe a little bit longer. And um, I wanted to bring him to the flat platform because he has a lot of knowledge that he can share with us uh, with regards to doing business in a densely populated area because where he is is you know, very kind of um, dense you know, with buildings and things of that nature versus kind of a sprawling suburb. Because I'm aware that those are you know, different geographic areas that you can work in. So thank you kindly, Michael, for being with us here today. My pleasure, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So if you'd be kind enough to kind of share with the listeners like your journey, right? Uh, as far as how you got into real estate, what that was like for you at the beginning um, and uh, where you're at currently. Well, I would say uh, um, it was scary to come into it. I started to get into real estate in late 2003, just as I was um, actually going through a divorce myself. And uh, I think for most people, it's pretty scary to start a career with no salary um, and not know, you know what success levels you're going to get and how do you proceed and go forward. Um, um, but from there, it was pretty instant that I said, wow, it took me 40 years of my life to figure out something that I not only enjoy, but that I'm really good at. And uh, it, 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 it just catapulted from there. Uh, I think the easiest way to talk about success, not just in real estate, but for a lot of people is be prepared to dive in and give it 110% and not 90%. Uh, but I guess the amount you commit also comes down to your goals. So I, I, dove, I dove in pretty quickly. Yeah, it seems like it. So, and I appreciate your authenticity with regards to kind of how initially when you started you know, there was um, some fear, right? I mean, that's a normal thing. You're getting into a hundred percent commission based business with no salary. And it sounds like you were doing that during a, um, you know, tough time, a tough life event. So what did you do kind of not only mentally to deal with that, but also um, from a practical perspective to get your business started? Well, I'll actually give you one little funny segue of a story as when I got started. Um, and then I'll answer that question. But I remember when I was considering going into real estate full time, the broker who I still work for um, said to me, oh, you'll be a natural, you know, you'll, you'll make a hundred grand a year, no problem, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, roll 16 and a half years later, and he's also a good friend of mine at this point. Um, I've always told him that he's lied to me because I've never made a hundred grand a year. Um, you know, so I, I think when you talk about what did I do to get started, I mentioned the word commitment. I worked seven days a week for I don't know how long when I got started. Um, yes, sitting in the office waiting for somebody to walk in might not be the best method. Doing an open house might not be the best method. But when you have zero, something that might only have a 10 or 15% success rate is better than a zero. So it's mm -hmm. a great way to meet some of your initial clients and hone your skills. So I just worked my butt off and I treated people right. And right from the beginning, I had clients that were just giving me referrals. That's awesome. So it's important for them to not realize that you're new. Yeah, so that's interesting. So I wrote down a couple things here, right? It's kind of circling back with commitment, but also um, the time, right? So you, you did seven days a week for a while. And I think you know one of the main reasons in my experience that people don't produce the outcomes that they want is because A, they don't fully understand what they're getting themselves into, which in this yep. business is a direct, hardcore sales business, like selling books door to door, knives door to door, subscriptions over the phone. And they also don't realize the level of time that's required uh, to put in in order to kind of get it up and off the ground. Yeah, your work ethic is gargantuan. Uh, I know that. Yeah, for sure. I think the only place, if I can go backwards and do things over again, Probably the only place that, I don't want to use the word fail, but the, other, the only place that I could have changed is I was completely on my own. I had no coaches, nobody guiding me. I just, you know, I woke up in the morning, somebody switched the, the, the switch from red to green, and I just went. Um, 
And I usually went until somebody shut the switch because I didn't know how to shut it. Yeah. And I think if I could start over again, I would have had somebody like yourself guiding me along the way. And maybe I would have reached my path sooner. Um, yet at the same time, I might be far ahead of where I am today. Yeah, that's interesting. And I appreciate that. And I know that that's very true for me as well, right? Like um, a teacher, a mentor, coach, whoever, they can condense decades worth of learning into days, weeks, or months. And, uh, you know, we can get there on our own, but we can get there perhaps a little bit quicker and with a little bit less bumps, right? Now, if we fast forward, I mean, you know, you're one of the top agents in your marketplace, uh, seven plus figure business. So what I thought we could talk about is the different pillars, right, in your business, because there's a few different pillars. And I wanted to zero in on those pillars because I believe that in areas or marketplaces like yours or New York City or in perhaps San Francisco or in just very Chicago, densely populated areas, what you've done in terms of these three pillars is very intelligent and clearly it works at a very high level. So the first one I want to talk to you about is kind of dominating like either a geographic area or like a building, because I know that you do a tremendous amount of business in a particular building uh, or set of buildings in your marketplace. So talk to me about like how you, how did you do that? Like, how did you start? How did you continue it? How did you get that off the ground? Yeah. So it's interesting because when I was starting in real estate, this building was not built for this community. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It was not, it was not there. And, um, as they were building it, I just said, it's going to be, that's going to be my, my community. And people talk about the the book, the secret, and I'm not a necessarily big believer in it, but I, through contacts that I knew a couple at the developer that was building it, who maybe introduced me to somebody. And I just kept doing work in that building. And like, as I said, the commitment to working the weekends, um, a few people bought them and wanted to flip them because that was the market back then. And I just did open houses every weekend and kept meeting people and kept meeting people and kept meeting people. Um, I would send out not just listed postcards to that community, but I actually did a three tier process for a long time. Uh, it was just listed. I would send a second postcard to them when it was under contract and I sent a third postcard to them when it was sold. Mm. Made me look like I was doing more work. Um, And people in the community just learned my name. And then after you get a certain rate of flow going, it's very easy when people ask you what you've done in a community. I mean, this is a community of, let's say, 550 condos-ish, maybe poaching 600. Um, Look, in 13 years, I've been involved with over 230 buyers and sellers in the community. I love that, man. It's just total domination. It's perfect. So what I hear you saying is, is initially just old school kind of elbow grease, beat the bushes, like asking people. And then once you got your foot in the door, then again, just like, you know, as much time as possible. And as transactions were happening, you proactively and aggressively letting people know via, you know, different channels. Like you said, you had that three tier process just listed. Hey, it's under contract. Hey, we sold it. And I'm also aware that I'm imagining anyway, part of that included actually calling into the building, following up on those just listed, just solds, uh, or just under contracts and just, um, letting people know, right. So they just get saturated with you and saturated with the fact that, you know, you're one of the main players in that, that building. Is that right? Um, that is, that is correct. Probably somebody from the building calling. They're gone. Yeah. Go ahead. That's awesome. So, and then you took another step because I'm pretty sure you, you, so, so when that was being built, you didn't live in the building, did you? No, I did not. I, I actually moved into the community five years ago, Yeah. but I've been selling there for 13. Yeah. Now I'm wondering, was that a strategic, intentional, purposeful move on your part? I mean, obviously it's a beautiful community, but also being one of the dominant players now that you live there, that just takes it to another level, right? Um, I don't think it was necessarily strategic. It, it hasn't hurt. Of course, I've met a couple of people. But what was interesting is, is speaking to a person occasionally that I had just moved into so-and-so. They said, oh, we saw you here so much. We thought you lived here. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So and I'm imagining like you're saying, like it doesn't hurt, right? Because now you're there and now not only are they getting all of the kind of pieces about all the transactions you're doing and calling into the building, but now they're seeing you all the time. Yeah. And, it, and it's really no different than the market. It's understanding the building. If somebody calls me up with a question, 
if you can answer somebody off the top of your head about anything in life, they view you more as an expert. Yeah, hundred percent. I've had agents because you know I coach a lot of agents in your marketplace, and some of them said like, "Dude, Mike knows more. Like he could tell you like the scratch on the wall in that building and where it came from." <laughs> yeah. They're just like amazed with the level of uh, information that is in your head with regards to that community. So, so it's yeah. So I guess. I know that that's been very successful and kind of profitable for you over time because that's also a high price point. And for those agents that are trying to like, again, in dense geographic areas, you just kind of gave them a blueprint if they want to dominate, you know, a building or, or a set of buildings and how to do so. Now, the other pillar of what you do, and I know you do it at a very high level is rentals. And I'm aware that sometimes people will be like, Oh, rentals, but I know the reason why we do it. So if you could talk a little bit about that segment yeah. of the business, the reasons why and how you do it. It's, it's interesting. A lot of people, when they get to a certain level, of course, they want nothing to do with rentals. Uh, my area happens to be an extremely, extremely large rental area. Um, and I've looked at it from a few point of views. And, and as a matter of fact, as you and I speak, and we're still owning what we want to do with it. Um, but I make a little bit of money from rentals, not a fortune. Um, I have a full-time assistant that just helps me manage that stuff. But many of my people who are renting their properties, they're not keeping their properties as rentals. They didn't buy them as investments. Maybe they didn't like the value of the market when they were exiting. So they rented it for two or three years and sold it. So the rentals continuously bring me uh, listings every year. Mm -hmm. My clients continuously give me referrals, whether it's other landlords, people looking to buy or people looking to sell. Um, but one of the biggest areas that we're looking to do right now, now that I have a, a, a rental manager is to make sure that we communicate with the tenants more. So when they're, you know, four months away from the lease ending, we call back into them and see if they want to buy a home. So one of my buyer specialists has a, has a good buyer lead. Um, and I, I've actually sat in there and done some calculations and said, wow, wouldn't it be wonderful if I can get it up to renting 50 properties a month, which is 600 properties a year, which is probably a million dollars worth of income. Yes. And it would only cost me, you know, even if I had to get three more assistants, if it cost me a quarter of a million dollars to run that arm, I'm still making three quarters of a million dollars and exponentially just getting more listings and more listings every year with what I'll, I don't want to call it no effort, less effort because they're already clients. Yes. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. So I'm, I'm just furiously taking notes as you're speaking. So the first one is, is like, you know, from a mental perspective, a lot of times agents, when they reach a certain level, they're like, ah, I don't want to deal with rentals, right? And not, not the great Michael Klein, no, because we recognize that from a long-term perspective, particularly in areas like you're saying, like yours, which is you know, a dense geographic area, kind of a, a walk, walkabout city, um, they end up being a source of listings. And I'm aware for you, it's a meaningful source of listings. So how many listings would you say that you, that you get per year because of the work that you do with rentals? I, I'm, I'm not the best one to be speaking to this about because I'm terrible at tracking numbers, but I probably get five to seven listings a year right now from, from rentals. Yeah. And what I'm aware of is in your geographic area, the average commission is like 15, 20,000 bucks. So it's, it's meaningful, right? It's oh yeah. It's real me. It's real meaningful. Yeah. For sure. And so, some of those people actually even call me up and say, we want to buy another investment. So it, it, it works very well. Works very well. And then it sounds as though we, there's a system in place for that, right? Because, you know, this idea that it, it is not the highest dollar amount activity for Michael Klein to be doing uh, himself and only himself as far as all the paperwork and things of that nature. So you actually have an assistant who handles the majority of that for you. Is that right? Yep. She's taken on more and more, hoping to get her up to, you know, handling 97% of it by the end of this year, yep. um, the more she handles, the better it is for the team, the better it is for me. That's wonderful. And then I'm imagining it didn't start that way though. Like I'm imagining perhaps you did it yourself. And then as time progressed, you recognize like, okay, it probably makes sense to have an assistant do this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's interesting. So, so again, if, if we're building a table, you know, I share with people all the time, we want to have multiple legs on the table, right? Cause that's what makes it sturdy. And I know you have, again, that like one geographic area, you dominate it. That's a source of, you know, 10, eight, 10 listings a year from that. 
We have the rentals that we do, which is another source of seven, eight, nine listings from that. And then there's this third stream, which is a very much so a niche, right? And I tell people all the time that the riches are in the niches. Yep. And I have a niche, you have a particular niche. And what I like about both of our niches is that they're around life events, right? So as all of this has happened and things have been changing as far as the virus is concerned, um, you know, only people that are motivated enough where their fear is, their motivation is greater than their fear are going to be in the market. And those people are going to be life event people. And one of them happens to be your niche, which is divorces. So if you can talk to kind of the audience about if that was intentional, did it happen by happenstance? And then once you bumped into it, what we've been doing together as a team to really get as much as we can out of that particular. Yep. Story. Great, great, great question. So was it intentional? Um, I'll say yes. I had started to try and do a little bit of probate, which was not working for me in my area. And then my area is young and I sat back and I said, you know what, the main focus of where I'm working is younger and there's more people getting divorced than dying. So maybe I need to reach out to some family law attorneys and maybe I can start getting referrals that way. Um, started reaching out to real estate attorneys I know to get intros to family law attorneys. Lo and behold, nobody knew any. Um, but one of the family law attorneys went to a networking group and then spoke to a psychiatrist he knew there who said and told him what I was looking to do. And she said, have him call this person and use my name. Um, and when I called that particular person, she said, hey, by the way, we have these meetings, which are for CLE credits for family law attorneys. Would you be interested in sponsoring the meeting? I asked her what was involved. She said it was 500 bucks a meeting. I said, how many meetings a year? She said eight. And I said, great, I'll take the year. And she said, what do you mean? I said, just book me for the year. Um, that was four and a half years ago. Um, I ran through a whole series or one, one, one season with nothing. And I will speak to everybody in saying, whether it's divorce or anything else you do, don't ever expect to go to a networking event and walk out the next day or next week with a, with a referral. Yeah. Again, it goes back to the commitment. It's a, it's a time game. And it's, but that is like, it, goal, it, you have to wait for it. Yeah, and that's such good guidance, Michael. So uh, I'm just, again, I'm taking notes as you're speaking. So that was four years ago. It didn't, it wasn't kind of like, you know, very, very purposeful or intentional. It just kind of happened. But then you made a, two commitments. One was with a financial commitment, right? Yeah. Um, and then the second was, is you went a whole season of sponsoring those for those attorneys and not a single transaction came from it. Nothing. And, and then I was, I was in the office one day and my assistant said there was a judge on the phone. Um, first, fear broke in until I realized in my own mind, if I did anything wrong, it wasn't a judge that would call me, it would be the police. <laughs> and I, uh, I picked up the phone. The judge just said that she heard me speak at a meeting about four months earlier. And she was court ordering a couple to sell their home. Um, can I meet with them in the afternoon? Um, and that was when it started. I was trying to meet attorneys. So instead of hitting a single, double, or triple, I wound up with a grand slam. Yes. And didn't even realize until that point that a judge can court order people to use a realtor. Yeah. And for those who aren't like aware, right, who are listening to this, the absolute beauty of it is um, if a judge does appoint, let's say they appoint Michael, uh, it's actually in the divorce decree. So they have to use Michael, like period, end of story. And also... They have to do whatever Michael suggests. So if there's, you know, typically in these dynamics, it's, uh, you know, two individuals who are parting ways and perhaps uh, having a very difficult time communicating with one another. And if there's disagreement with regards to, let's say, adjusting the price or anything that needs to be done, uh, Michael just goes in front of the judge. The judge tells him, like, hey, you got to do what Michael says. And that's it. Is that right? Um, there's variations on every case. But yes, I have had cases where the court order comes down that says Michael will determine the value. Michael will determine if it needs a price adjustment. Um, I've had people complain about commissions and they want to ask the judge. And of course I'll go to the judge. They don't want to sign the agreement. They want a lower commission. Do you want me to lower it? And they say, no. Um, so the, the, the court has a lot more power than many of us are thinking, even when it comes to selling a home. Yeah. So that's wonderful, man. So I love this idea of like, you know, being a long-term game, you stayed with it right? After a full year, like most people I'm aware, like after a month, you know, I mean, you know, most people after prospecting for a week or a day, if they don't like immediately set an appointment, they get disappointed and they want to stop. But you stuck with it 
Then you got a phone call. And from that phone call came a relationship. Yes. And then from that relationship, and I'm noticing a pattern here, by the way, with regards to how you, you know, got into that building and such, same dynamic. You formulated a relationship, and then you really did your best to service that relationship at a high level. Is that correct? Yeah. And part of me doesn't even want to use the word relationship. It was, it was more, I developed a respect for mm -hmm. my knowledge, experience, and ability that gave the court the confidence to appoint me to something. Yes. Because it's, again, guys, it's not a relationship. You're not taking the judge out to lunch or dinner. It'll never happen. Yeah. Um, you can't do it. Um, but the service factor was this particular judge um, had given me her email. So I would email her. You know, Your Honor, I have a meeting with the couple on this date. Um, Your Honor, I have a signed listing agreement by the husband, but not the wife yet. Um, and then what happened, Aaron, one day was I actually emailed the judge. And I said, Your Honor, do I email you too much? And she said, no. And she's very hands-on. And she said, you don't realize how useful you are to me. It's awesome. She said, you help me move files. Very often, if somebody's not listening or signing or doing something, by the time their attorney files an emergent order, it's two, three, four weeks later. If there's a particular buyer involved, the buyer's gone. Uh, I've had instances where the, I have a, what I consider a very fair value in the range that I gave them. And then one spouse doesn't want to accept it. And I would just email the judge and she'd email back, is it a fair value? And I said, it's at the lower end, but it's definitely within range of what I told them to expect. And she said, no problem. I'll speak to their attorney. You'll have an accepted offer in two days. Yeah, that's awesome. So, and I appreciate the distinction, right? Um, where not necessarily like a relationship. I mean, that's part of it, but it's more so like you're saying like uh, professional respect where yeah. they recognize like, a, Michael has integrity. B, he knows what he's talking about. And C, he's going to do what's in the best interest of, you know, all parties involved. And then D, he's going to communicate with me constantly during that process. Yeah. So if I could just go into that communication part a little bit more. So every time I got assigned a court case, nine out of 10 times, I didn't know at least one or possibly two of the attorneys involved, the family law attorneys. So the first thing I would do is call myself, introduce myself to them, tell them how I work. You know, my goal is not to favor either one of them, but to, of course, to be there to uh, help both of them get back to happy land. And you've got to be really comfortable with speaking to two parties who are fighting with each other and getting them comfortable that you're not here to tell party B what party A told you and, and vice versa. And make sure to keep the family law attorneys updated mm. of what's going on, even if it's once a month. Because the family law attorneys that I've spoken to said that's their biggest concern is they just don't know. Uh, an interesting side note that I've learned by doing divorce, most family law attorneys don't get the majority of their fees until the house sale is done. Ah, how very interesting. <laughs> because that's where the big chunk of money comes from very often. Yeah. So you know, you want these people, they, they want you to help them get it sold, but yet to do it properly and take care of their clients. Yeah. So I wrote down two things here. Like the first one is, is, uh, cause I'm, I really do believe, you know, like how Jim Rohn says, he's like, you know, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. And some of the skills that you're describing to me, it's like not only like intellectual intelligence, like understanding a geographic area, understanding how to, you know, comp property, understanding the process so you can guide people through it. But the other thing that I'm hearing from you is a different type of intelligence and it's emotional intelligence. So yeah. having the emotional intelligence that's required in order to remain very diplomatic and impartial when you have two parties that clearly don't like each other. Absolutely. I'm dealing with one now. We actually just got it into contract last night. Um, this case has been going on for, for six months. They, they, some of them take a lot longer, but the divorce was 11 years ago. The wife living in the home has a 90 year old mom who's sick with cancer. So she doesn't want to let people in. She won't commit to a closing date, even though we have an accepted offer because she hasn't found a home to move to. Um, and you know, again, it, it takes a little bit of finesse and patience. Um, I will say if you, two things, if you go into this area 
you have to go into it, number one, realizing that you're going to help the attorneys and sometimes not get paid. So I do offer attorneys uh, free CMAs. And I have a few that take me up on it because I know that if they meet with 10 clients a year, they might only be able to refer me to one or two. Yeah. They either don't own a home or maybe they're going to settle. But you need to be the attorney's um, resource. So that's number one. And uh, number two, my promise has always been to the court that even if they court order something and in the process of me listing the property, um, the court decision to sell the home gets reversed. Then I take it off the market and there's no charge to the clients. Mm. And people say, why would you do that? And I say, well, let me ask you, have you ever listed any other regular home in your life that the people changed their mind or it didn't sell and you just took it off the market? It's, it's the same thing. So act like a professional and, and, and let everybody know that you're there to help when needed, but you'll step aside if things change. That's awesome, man. So I, just, I wrote down a few things like, like how to add value. Right, because I feel like a lot of people, whatever the source is, they're immediately when they go in, they're thinking, "How? What can I take? Like, what can I get from this?" Instead of, "What can I give to this?" or "What can I give to these people?" Right. So, I heard you say like, uh, like being a resource, you know, for the attorneys and for the judge, right? Like just being a resource of information, being a resource of um, kind of time and energy and effort, and being unattached to the outcome in the sense that if it doesn't work out. Uh, you're okay with that. You don't charge any money for it, which is, I mean, that's pretty um, unprecedented, right? Because that comes from a place of like abundance instead of like scarcity. Like yeah, trying to pull out every. Also, a resource for many of the clients. I've had a few clients that don't have family law attorneys, mm. and they tend to come to you for questions. Yes. So I always start off with, "I'm not an attorney, but this is what I've seen happen in the past." Yeah. And most of them say, "Wow, you're part realtor, you're part, you know, psychologist." Um, and because you're not their attorney advising them and of course you're not the judge mandating what they do, sometimes they listen to you a little bit differently because it's a different, it's a different angel on their shoulder giving them advice. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting that you say that because I find I do the same thing. Like my niche is, um, like a state and probate and, uh, based on that specialized knowledge of that kind of the legal aspect of things, we can add value there and give guidance where attorneys perhaps, you know, um, they might not have the time or take the time to explain things. And if you understand it, you can add value that way. And I think you solidify yourself very clearly as somebody who uh, has a deep kind of knowledge of that, right? So, and it's a way that you can switch from being just transactional, like I'll help you sell the property, to being fiduciary. They're like, I can actually guide you and, um, you know, help you to make decisions that are in your best interest as it pertains to not only selling the real property, but just navigating the legal aspect of things. Yeah. Now, um, and then the other thing I wrote down is like you, you recognize, you do, Michael does, that, that part of the value is, is the communication that you give to the uh, family law attorneys, mm -hmm. to the judge, right? You recognize that those attorneys have a vested interest in selling the real property because oftentimes their compensation is tied to it. So they want to you kind of use them as allies, right? And then the fourth thing I wrote down is just results is that, you know, you ultimately de don't deliver, you get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So here we are, we have these awesome pillars, right? Pumping out deals. I know you, again, seven plus figure business, you're a top agency in your marketplace. So, so what can the great Michael Klein work on? Like what, what are ways that we can take you to your next level? Like what are your kind of, in your mind, things that um, you're looking to improve upon? Everything. <laughs> um, one has to, I'll still say I could always do better with communication with clients. Um, delegation to the assistants, which would give me more time to do the things that I have to do. Yeah. Uh, better systems, whether it's from me to my assistant or, or, or wherever that system takes us. Um, and I think we can also always just all hone in on our skills a little bit better. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'm writing down here, like just systems to become more efficient, right? Because yes. again, we have these three pillars that are, you know, pumping out awesome business. And then, um, you know, the, the skill and art of communication that it is very much so an art. And uh, just like anything that we look to master, I mean, it's, I feel like for me anyway, I'm sure it's true for you too, is that it's a um, never ending, there's no finish line. 
there's no finish line. Um, jokingly, the judge has asked me, do I really enjoy doing these divorce things, for example? And I say yes, because they're not, every case is different. And it's not like selling Mary's home who calls you up and says, we're relocating. Um, you've got different type of disputes to deal with. And you want to talk about honing in on some negotiation skills and how to communicate. Yes. Deal, deal, when you're dealing with a divorcing couple, you're not dealing with an entity. You're, not, you're dealing with them as a couple selling their home. You're dealing with him as an individual. You're dealing with her as an individual. And then you might be dealing with their divorce attorneys. Yep. You're dealing with so many different aspects and personalities. Um, and you've got to learn what you can say to people, what you can't say to people, what you could leak out what you can't leak out um, and being able to really get people comfortable. So when I meet a new divorcing couple, one of the first things I do is tell them that, look, I'm here to help you get back to happy land. And what you tell me will not be discussed with the other side, unless it has any, something to do with a pure negotiation. And I say, and let me give you an example. And I give them an example of something I did for a divorcing couple where the wife wanted to keep the home and I was helping her get a mortgage. And the husband was shocked when he found out two months later. And when he told me she wanted to keep the home, I said, you're kidding me. Um, that was my privacy with her. This yeah. had nothing to do with selling the home. Sure. And ultimately, I got him to agree to sell her the home because I'm like, look, she's offering you full price. What are you concerned about? But so it really, really, really helps you working on your negotiation skills and, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying and building that to 25 to 30 divorces a year. I know. We're working on that together as a team. Once uh, I heard uh, about like, you know, what we were doing there, it's like, oh, yeah, man, let's, let's continue to grow that and build that, formulate some more kind of relationships in that vein. And then the other thing I wrote down here, which you didn't mention, right, because I know we're working on it, is um, just letting more people know right? Like who you are and what you do, right? And, and I'm aware that technology magnifies greatness. Like Michael Klein's already great. We just need to magnify that and have more people know within that niche that he's the guy. He's trustworthy. You know, judges trust him. Attorneys trust him. Clients trust him, right? Definitely working on getting myself, we'll call it in the social world a little bit more um, because that's not my forte. Yes. And, and I'm the person that struggles to implement and I need, I need people who can help me implement because I, I see the, the definite successes of, of being able to do that. Yeah. And you see the value in it, right? And, and you are doing it, right? Uh, and I have an upfront front seat to that, right? So you are systematically doing it, uh, perhaps not at the speed that we, you would like, or perhaps not yep. as, you know, in the quantity, but you are incrementally over time and you've already started to see results. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. So I guess for agents out there that are, I don't know, looking at like a niche like this, like if you were to make a blueprint for them, like what would you tell them? Um, first is decide that you want to do something and commit to it and realize that it's not necessarily, somebody might get lucky and get success in first week, first month, but realize that commitments take time. Yes. Um, you know, nobody became whether it's the president of a company or anything else, uh, the day they graduated college, they worked their way up and, and, and they took time. So remember things take time. Um, number two, continuously take a look at what you're doing and seeing if there's a way to improve on it to further get to your goal or get to your goal maybe at a quicker pace. Um, and just, I mean, again, just differentiate yourself and talk to a lot of people. Yeah. It's Talk to a lot of people. Don't be afraid to ask people, do you, can you introduce me to this, to that person? And if they don't know it, then go ask somebody else and just keep going and going and going. And if you keep pushing hard enough, it's, I mean, push with respect, but if you keep pushing forward hard enough, uh, you'll make it happen. hundred percent. So here's the blueprint, ladies and gentlemen, make a, make a steadfast commitment that this is what you are going to do. Right. And, and you're not going to stop when you're tired. You're not going to stop when, uh, you know, you feel like it. You're going to stop when it's done. Right. Um, the second one is, is have somebody perhaps watching what you're doing to evaluate it on a regular basis to make sure that it's a, as effective and efficient as possible. And then just talk to a lot of people. 
right? Talk to as many people as you possibly can. Don't be afraid to ask questions. What it makes me think about, Michael, is this is ex the exact kind of blueprint that I used as far as um, that segue into the niche that I'm in, where I think you know the story, like I did 100 deals one year and 75 were expired, but then the expired started to go away uh, because the marketplace got good. So I um, got frustrated. And uh, after about a couple of months, I realized like, oh, the amount of leads that I, I that are available are not enough to do the deal flow that I want. And then, you know, I made a commitment. Okay, we got to do like this other source. So I picked this source. And then uh, I asked, just like you said, a ton of people questions. And I looked silly, right? And I'm aware that um, I feel like in many ways that could be a barrier to entry, right? Because you go from being like consciously or unconsciously competent, so good at something that you don't have to think about it anymore, that you have to start over from scratch at something that's like brand new. And you gotta fumble and stumble and ask what would appear to be silly questions, like how does this work? Like, who do I need to talk to? What's the beginning part, right? And um, then now, five years later, just like you, that has become you know, a meaningful, meaningful source of business. So I think that's wonderful, man. And uh, I, again, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with me. I think- My pleasure. I think people are going to get tremendous value from our time together. So if people have referrals or if they need to find you, where could they find you at? Um, they can call me on my cell, 201-320-5371. Uh, my email is michael at mkgroupproperties.com. And I am located in Hoboken, New Jersey. Awesome. And you will be in terrific hands with Mr. Michael Klein. So thank you, brother. I appreciate you. And uh, I look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, Aaron. My pleasure. Bye-bye.